All right, welcome along to the final RT Soccer World Cup podcast for 2022. Raf Giallo here. We've watched one of the most tense and dramatic World Cup finals in living memory. Argentina won it twice in 120 minutes and still nearly lost it. They had to go and win it a third time via penalties. 3 3 draw between Argentina and France at the Luceo Stadium, and then the Argentinians winning 4 2 on spot kicks. It marks 36 years since Maradona went and guided Argentina to victory uh, in Mexico. And it's also eight years on from the iconic image of Messi walking past the trophy at the Maracanã. But now Lionel Messi, now with probably underlined as the greatest player of this generation, has that moment and he has that World Cup trophy. And we will talk about the whole GOAT conversation later on. But to do all that, I'm joined by Peter Brannigan of RT Sport Online and also former Ireland international Keith Tracy. Uh, Peter, <laughs> you know, if there's a messy movie, and there probably will, because there, there seems to be movies about pretty much any current contemporaneous figure, they couldn't have written a better script in terms of the end of his international career. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, an absolutely fantastic, well, a fantastic game, probably... Uh, certainly from maybe 70, 75 minutes onwards, it was an absolutely enthralling encounter. Uh, yeah, I thought he got the winner in extra time and I was thinking he'd done it, but then obviously he stepped up and took the penalty so well uh, in the shootout. So yeah, it was it was absolutely brilliant. And it was mentioned, I think, maybe in commentary or maybe by some of the lads afterwards that he, um, you know, he wasn't over, he was delighted at the end, whereas all the other players were kind of crying. He, he like... I'm sure he'll be telling the press conference he was relieved more than anything. But uh, yeah, absolutely unbelievable moment. And I suppose on that theme of his, the movie about his life, who plays the part of Messi, Raph? That's the big question. That's an interesting one that we leave to. Well, if people want to tweet it in or whatever, um, I, I won't. I won't actually read the tweets, but um, we I, we, we will take requests. Um, but Keith, uh, where do you stand on this in terms of? Is it the best World Cup final you can remember? Yeah. Uh, well. Yeah. Look at the the this. The extra time was really good. I think for probably in around the 80th minute when France came to life, that's when it really started to look as when Argentina were 2 0 up, France looked looked gone. They looked like they'd nothing. They ended up winning a penalty. Otto Mendy gets his pocket picked and then ends up giving away a silly penalty, quite similar to the Di Maria penalty, but that was the lifeline in. Uh, Mbappe goes and hits the back of the net. And within another 60 seconds down the line, they're two all in the game. And the one thing I really liked about it was for me, this could end up sounding a bit silly. I don't think Mbappe had a great game. He scored a hat trick in the, in the game, but from open play, I, I don't think he was he was in the game whatsoever. Crazy considering he scored a hat trick. I know two of them are penalties, but the one thing I really like is when uh, when that ball gets played over the top. He plays the little header inside. Ball gets played over the top. He hits a first time on the volley. That's a confidence thing, you know. He'd only just scored his penalty. He hits it early. If he takes a touch, I think the Argentinians might just come and close the door on him. Martinez gets a good strong hand on it as well, but there was just too much pace on the strike, and that was that was Mbappe's little little moments here and there that he, that he showed us. But yeah, Messi for all the walking he does, he's just so so dangerous, and he had that little bit of bite in him as well today. He went and won the ball back a couple of times. So yeah, look, me me heart was always saying I wanted Messi to win it. My head was saying France would go and win it. But yeah, I have to say I'm delighted how it worked out, and you know whether or not Messi is the greatest of all time. It didn't hinge on this World Cup for me. I think he's he's up there anyway. It's the best of all time. Yeah, I think other than people, other than you know French supporters, I think uh, pretty much everyone else kind of felt that uh, sense of wanting to see a story unfold, and that's that's what has happened. But um, let's just start talk about the start of the game, Keith. Um, you you mentioned you know France weren't really in it, and it goes for the first seventy to eighty minutes. I mean, how did and we we might we we'll talk about our Di Maria a little bit later on, but how did Argentina close the space because? We, you know, pre-match we were talking about Mbappe being the key figure on the left-hand side. And then even if you stop him, there's Griezmann, there's Giroud. So what did Argentina do well to actually control that game for a large part of the normal time? Well, the, the press, uh, first and foremost, was really, really good. I think France played into the Argentinian hands. You knew, you know, France, you know the, the build-up around the World Cup. You know there's so much emotion around the Argentinians. You know they're desperate to go and win it. So that for me, you're going to expect a really high pressure. You're going to expect them to be all sorts of work rate, all sorts of desire and passion all over the pitch. So for me, you don't start playing balls into the middle of the pitch. You don't give them any sort of encouragement. Theo Hernandez, the left back for France, he was absolutely awful for the whole game. He ended up getting taken off and they, they put Camavinga left back. That's how bad he was. They put a, a hold of midfielder back at left back. He was really, really poor. 
every time he got the ball, he was looking for Mbappe, but Mbappe was standing there looking back at him. Tucci Mendy was quite static in the middle. Griezmann couldn't get on the ball whatsoever. So for me, just go and chip it into the space over, over, over the Argentinian press. Tell Mbappe to start running after it. He doesn't have to win that ball. He just has to plant a little seed into the Argentinian press that they're just going to chip it over my head. Then the next two or three times down the line, that press won't be as sharp because he's expecting you to kick the ball long. When they drop off, you start fizzing balls into the midfield. For me, you could see Didier Deschamps just going mental on the line because the French weren't at the races. And it, it wasn't even a... Like a, a technically, they were playing badly. They just the, the walk rate, the passion. It just they didn't match the Argentinians whatsoever all over the pitch. And yeah, you look at a fast start from Argentina. We all knew that was going to happen, but it looked like the French were were bewildered by it. And I know just this thing coming out about a virus. Giroud got taken off. Then Bele got taken off. Griezmann got taken off. You know, if if that comes out to say they, they were they were sick and they they you know got strapped up and put out, that's fair enough. They they're doing a bit for the country, but so many of them were off colour. The French for the first you know probably eighty minutes, it was utter domination from the Argentinians. And like I said, they're quite lucky to get a lifeline back into the game. But when they did, they seized it, and you know probably penalties is a lottery in the end of the day. And they they came out the wrong side of that. But for you know the the hundred and twenty minutes or so, they weren't good enough. Yeah, and Angel Di Maria, who had floated out of the starting lineup, Peter. I mean, um, he was he was he was floated back in, featured for an hour, and in the first two goals, he's obviously the most decisive. Um, yeah, yeah, and and um, like as as Keith says, it was just France was sort of so poor. It was such a dominant performance, I suppose, uh, from Argentina, and France also just looked, really looked off uh, on the, in possession in terms of where they were at in midfield. Like, there was. Numerous occasions they were talking about it at half time in our own coverage in RT of France being in possession and not being under a massive amount of pressure, but trying to pick our players in the middle of the park and just just losing it. So um yeah, uh, it was it was one of those things that gave you the smallest, tiniest little bit of hope heading into next year with France coming to Dublin and us going over there that you know put a little bit of pressure on France maybe and um, mistakes can come. But I do think I'll be really interested if Keith touched on it, that that whole virus area. I mean you know what happened there? Where, where like players didn't look one hundred percent. So was that part of it? Was it just the tournament catching up with them? Where was it the tactics? But there, there seemed to be a lot about it this morning in various different uh, news wires and stuff. So I'll be really interested to see how, how what level those players are at because some of them were just not at the races at all, really. Yeah, it's, it's not quite Spurs lasagna gate from 2006, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> I remember so well against West Ham. But um, in regard to Angel Di Maria, Keith, I mean, uh, the positions he was picked, because again, they, uh, what's been interesting about Scaloni, he sort of matched the opposition in terms of the tactics. So played a back three against the Dutch in the start of the game, um, packed the midfield with sort of narrow, or play, like DePaul and McAllister playing wide, but obviously more used to playing centrally um, in the in the semi-final against Croatia uh, to match the Croatian midfield. And then this curveball of Di Maria coming in and starting wide left. And um, I don't know, did you get the sense that France were a bit caught out by it? Yeah, I, I said that uh, in my build-up. I, I thought when Deschamps got the, when he would have got the Argentinian lineup and seen Di Maria playing wide on the left and he has Jules Koundé playing right back, I'm sure Deschamps would have thought, oh God, I'd like to have that back. Now, I'm not sure what's going on with Pavard. He hasn't really featured this World Cup, but I like Pavard as a player. He's a natural right-back. He'd give you a little bit more, a little bit more nous. I know uh, Dembele is the one who gets done by Di Maria for the goal. It's, you know, at top-level football, especially international football, if you make a mistake, the one thing you can't do is compound it with another mistake. And when Dembele uh, gets done for the, he's about Di Maria, his shape, like he's about to cross him with his left foot. That's the lesser of two evils. I know in hindsight, it's easy to think about it, but, if Di Maria is about to whip that ball in, who's he whipping it into? Messi. I know he's good in the air, but he's a small guy. Alvarez is a small guy. McAllister was making them toward man runs. They're not big guys. So the lesser of two evils is to let him put that ball into the box. You can't let him come back in. Once he comes back in, he's in the box now. You can't compound it with another mistake. and You can't put any sort of contact on him. That's what Di Maria is looking for. And as soon as Di Maria feels the slightest of touches on his back, he's going down and... Look, I thought Di Maria was excellent. And I have to be honest, I thought he was a little bit over the hill coming into this tournament. We haven't seen an awful lot of him. So much of his game is that bit of pace, that bit of uh, being able to manipulate the ball. I thought he'd lost the pace to get away from people, but he, he was excellent. He really was. He just hugged that left line. And Kunde was getting so tight to Varane that there was just so much space out there. And he took, he took um, 
there was, there was a dodgy enough decision for me to play Di Maria when I seen his name I thought I'm not sure about that McAllister coming off the left Alvarez and Messi up front would probably be a better thing for me but I got a spot on absolutely got a spot on fair play to, to Scaloni yeah, whereas uh, Didier Deschamps decided to change tactics and uh, 40 minutes in, takes off Giroud, Churam comes on, obviously son of the great Lilian Churam from the 1998 team, and uh, Kolo Mouani also comes on uh, for Dembele, who had given away that d- a penalty you, you just referred to there, and then Mbappe goes central. Uh, obviously the shape largely stays the same, but it seemed to be a surprise, Keith, I mean, because we, we'd seen Argentina struggle against the Dutch with, uh, you know, a tall target man, which is what Giroud is, um, and Mbappe going down the middle. Obviously, it does work out later on, but what did you make of it? Because it didn't seem like the changes had a, an effect straight away. Yeah, I, I was I was a bit baffled by it, Rafa, a little bit like you, because Charam came on and he, he actually did quite well. He won a lot of uh, long balls and then you were picking up the second balls and you were able to build from that type of platform. But I don't see what Charam can give you that Giroud didn't give you. You know, they just didn't seem to play them balls up to Giroud. And I'm not sure if Giroud was maybe one affected by the virus because he seemed way, way off. And look, when you when your stats are up there with goal scoring and the ability of Thierry Henry, then, you know, you need to be respected. But for him to be whipped off after 40 minutes and Dembele to be taken off, I'm not sure if Deschamps has seen them in the background and thought maybe these are a little bit more affected. I'm hearing Varane was, was very unwell, but just patched himself up to get out there. So, I'm sure that'll all come out in the wash in the next few days. But look, at you know, I, I keep saying it, it wasn't even a football thing that you're saying. They didn't turn up in terms of that talent. It was work rate. It was desire. And that sort of thing does fall into being unwell because you just can't get yourself up there. And Look, again, it was just the determination, the passion. It just seemed to be written in the stars for Argentina. It just seemed to be destiny for Messi. And when he scored that goal in extra time, I thought, he, that's it. He scored the goal. He's won it which actually fell a little bit flat with VAR. They weren't sure to celebrate or not celebrate. But look, it's, it's great. It's great for Messi, great for Argentina. And, you know, it's probably fitting now that we've just lost Diego Maradona as well, that you've managed to go and do it. I think it means so much to, to the country and Messi himself. But again, the friends should be kicking themselves because, you know, they played, played well in parts of this game, very, very small parts of the game. And they were able to hurt the Argentinians. But for so, so long, they were just non-existent in the game. Yeah, but Peter, I think we've seen it before. Like there is that cliche, of course, two 0 is a dangerous lead, but uh, especially when it comes to Argentina in this World Cup. So we've seen it in the uh, in the quarter final game where the Dutch <laughs> managed to equalise. Even the game before against Australia, the Aussies almost uh, almost took it to extra time, but for good, good goalkeeping from Martinez, who we'll talk about later. And uh, obviously the Croatia game that went a little bit better for the Argentinians, but th- you never got a sense that you could really, if you were leaning that way, that you could really trust them to, to hold the lead. No, although I haven't said that, like I, I essentially agree with you, although up until 75, 76 minutes, France were starting to build in that previous 10 minute spell before they got the two couple of goals. But ultimately, I was thinking, like, this is just going to be, it's going to kind of just finish off. The, the narrative was written, it'll be 2 0, it'll be handy enough. Um, it was just once the first goal went in, they absolutely wobbled. And I mean, the second one comes so quickly, they barely, I suppose, really have time to settle. But then there was great credit out to them in the first half of extra time. They were really good again and I mean they obviously got the third goal but they possibly could have got another goal as well so um yeah like they certainly teams showed they could get at them um so whether that comes down to concentration or whatever like there's a, a real intensity to the way Argentina played in this competition and I suppose that must be particularly tiring and you know it's a lot of concentration that would go into it but uh, it certainly made for entertaining games I mean the game against the Dutch was was again one that I, it looked like they had it won and you know, the Netherlands equalising so late in it. And then today, an absolutely brilliant game because, I mean, that's kind of what you want. I, I'm sure we've, you've discussed it on other podcasts. I know the World Cup finals don't tend, generally tend to be brilliant games. So when you get um, a game where both sides are kind of susceptible to leaking a couple of goals, it, it, you know, as a neutral, makes it a much more entertaining game to watch. Yeah, and obviously uh, France, is how they fought back um, in a two-minute spell around the 80s minute mark. So first, a penalty very similar to the one that they had given away um, when it came to Di Maria. So it was Otamendi uh, bringing down Colo Muani and uh, obviously Mbappe converts it. And then just after that, he scores uh, the he scores the, the equaliser and uh, on the way to his hat-trick. But Keith, in terms of Argentina's game management, what, what went wrong? <laughs> what went wrong for them? I think they had any type of game management whatsoever. The Argentinians, you know... When you look at their, their centre-half pair, and if I'd have told you that Christian Romero and Otamendi are going to get you to the World Cup and final, not only that, they're going to win it for you. 
You know, there would have been huge question marks and huge eyebrows raised. But they are different players when they play for Argentina. They've been really, really good. The, the, the standout player for me, this is probably looking at it through a, a little bit of uh, Irish eyes, but McAllister was excellent. I, I've seen an awful lot of him for Brighton. He's been really, really good. I know Brighton at top half of the Premier League, but I think he's one that can make the next step. I think he's been really, really good. And Julian Alvarez up front, you know, I know Messi's going to get all the plaudits, but Julian Alvarez, only 22, seen bits and bobs of him at Manchester City. I know he can hit the back of the net, four goals in the World Cup, but when you've got Messi, who's a little bit of a luxury player that won't go and chase the ball for you, you need somebody who'll pick up the, the slack, and Julian Alvarez does that. You want to see the tackles he's putting in, he's walk great, right, and he has that talent as well to match it up. It's uh, it's really, really good. And the, the one thing I like about Argentina, and I know we when we talk about Messi, we generally go on to Ronaldo. When you look at Ronaldo with the Portuguese team, the Portuguese team didn't seem to want to win the World Cup for Ronaldo. But everybody, the Argentinian players, wanted to win it for Messi. You could see, as soon as Molina scores the winning penalty, everybody's turning and running to Messi. It was all about Messi. And there's some big, big egos in the Argentina team, but it all got parked for Messi. And uh, yeah, like I say, just absolutely delighted that he managed to get it over the line. Yeah, and if we're going to talk about big egos in the Argentinian team, Peter, I think this is where we talk about Emiliano Martinez. Obviously, the lasting image of the goalkeeper uh, at this tournament might be uh, how he handled that uh, goalkeeper at the tournament trophy at the end. <laughs> I'm not sure what we can really, if we can say too much about that. But <laughs> but um, obviously, look, uh, he had a record in the Copa America of being a good penalty saver. And probably there was a sense that in comparison to Hugo Lloris, when it came to a shootout, he was going to make the difference. But he also made a world-class save at the end of uh, extra time as well. Yeah, well, that was it. I mean, we were all jumping up and down the office without a chance right at the end when it looked like he was going to uh, score the goal. He, he made a save uh, with an area as well as with his legs and just, you know, spread himself and made a brilliant save. But yeah, I mean, like you look at the records again through the matches. I, we were saying in the, a couple of minutes ago about um, Argentina leaking goals, but it wasn't him. I mean, he was he was absolutely brilliant, and um, yeah, he was he was definitely willing to rile other players up and get up in their faces again, which was maybe something true of, of all of Argentina. But even the first penalty he saved, he very clearly ran across the channel of the French player jumping up and down. It wasn't unintentional, you know that kind of way. So. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, that's a right towards the end. That's what won it for them. That was that was the tournament for France. We all thought that that was going to be it, and TVs were all on at different times in the office, and people were kind of jumping up and all over the place. But uh, yeah, uh, he, he did absolutely superbly. And um, we discussed it a lot ourselves about Hugo Lloris and why the back him in a penalty shootout. And I think you know we we said we kind of said there was an element of Shea going against Spain and Mendieta back in two thousand and two to one of the penalties. But there was there was a couple of occasions when he just. For a couple of the penalties, he didn't really get in anywhere close to them. So, um, despite the level he's playing at, and despite how good he can be, I don't know. He didn't look mass like overly confident as the tournament progressed, even though France were winning. So, um, yeah, I, I, as you as, as you said, like I would have backed uh, backed Argentina purely based on goalkeepers, um, coming into a penalty shootout. Yeah, and Mbappe scored three penalties um, across 120 minutes in penalty shootouts, obviously two in the game, and then um, both him and Messi went up first and scored their kicks after that, and, and obviously Mbappe as well, just to note, uh, his first hat-trick in a final since uh, Jeff Hurst in 1966, albeit maybe some of the Germans might, uh, supporters at the time might claim that uh, that might be a brace rather than a hat-trick, but uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, an argument for another day. Um, and he also claims the golden boot, and he's just one goal off, just Fontaine's friend record for goals in a World Cup. He's got a 12 overall, which is outstanding for a player who's just turned 23. On the other penalties that the French took, actually, Keith, uh, any thoughts on them in terms of, was there anything you noticed in terms of maybe technique or anything that was a bit off? Just looking at, at Tuchemani taking his penalty, I, I know he's only a young guy. I'm not sure whether somebody should have stepped up a, an older statesman. You never like to see the, the young lads getting, getting put up there, but Look, you have to hit the target from a penalty. I know he's trying to get it right into the corner, but you know the bare minimum is to hit the target from a penalty. And yeah, it's just not good enough. And it's just another aspect of the game where the French fell down. And when it can, when it comes to penalties, it really is a lottery. But when you've got Messi standing up and he just walks up to the ball and slowly strokes it into the corner, and you got is going one way and going the other. You're just thinking he's settling everybody. You see your star man going up and saying, don't worry about it, lads. This is quite an easy thing to do, but it didn't look easy for the French, that's for sure. 
Yeah, and uh, Peter, I suppose before we uh, before we started recording, we were talking about like just the different ages of the people who are going to be on the podcast. So Keith, uh, thirty four, I believe. Uh, Peter and myself at thirty three. So more or less, I think we're we've seen the same World Cups and the same generation of players uh, coming through. But uh, Peter, in terms of the the our generations hold this all this goal chat, and we'll talk about the overall one in a sense soon. But uh, in terms of the this Messi Ronaldo thing, it this was probably answered before the final anyway, but. Definitely now, I think there's a, there's going to be a separation. Yeah, for, for as much as these things are worth anything, I mean, as Keith touched on earlier on, I think, I think Messi's greatness was already written long before he won this World Cup final and the, what he's done over the last, what is it, fit was 16 years ago, 16 and a half years ago since he made his World Cup debut for Argentina. Like, it's long since written. We know how good he is. Um, I suppose it's like a narrative thing. It's, it's something for us to talk about, the fact that he went and won it at the end. But... I mean, even in the uh, even in the games earlier on in the game against Croatia, like a couple of times he got down that right wing for one of the goals as well, where he, you know, it looked like Croatia had him and got him in the right position, and he just turns quickly at you know at the age he's at, he's still able to do it. So yeah, like he's 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 definitely the once in a generation player. Um, I never saw him play, Raf. I don't know if you ever got to actually see him in person. Oh, Messi, yes. Uh, once when I was on Erasmus in 2008, living in Seville, um, had to pay over the odds <laughs> for, to, go, to go and see them. Barcelona, who I didn't realise at the time were going to be the, uh, you know, the greatest club side we've probably ever seen. Um, so it was just as a start, the first season, Pep's first season, first few months of it. And yeah, Messi scored a couple of goals. Couldn't, like, uh, I could probably sit here and tell you I remember the goals and all that, all that well. I don't, but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, he's gone on to be the great of the generation. So kind of privileged to have seen that because I don't think I'm gonna I don't think I'll have the chance to to watch him again. But um even more importantly, Keith, you have um you've actually shared the pitch with him. Your debut, am I right, for Ireland against Argentina, August 2010. Uh what do you remember of that? And I suppose following Messi's career from afar after that as well. <laughs> well, I didn't get to share well, maybe I did, maybe a, a second or so I got to share the pitch room as Trapatoni turned to me and told me I was coming on. I went and stood on the halfway line, getting the numbers and the boots ready. And I looked up and Messi's coming off for Argentina. So literally, oh. as I was coming on, Messi was coming off. And I was about a yard away from him, just, in, just looking at him absolutely starstruck, just wishing he would be still on the pitch. But look, I, I, I managed to see him once or twice playing with Barcelona in that, in that great team, as you were saying, Raf. And he's the one last luxury player. You know, people are putting Neymar and Mbappe, Ronaldo up there. He's the one. Uh, luxury player he's the one player that you can say okay you can walk around and when we win it we'll give it to you and you'll make things happen because when the chips are down Messi delivers it whether it's for his club or whether it's for his country he always always delivers so he's the one last luxury player and look, I, I, I never played against Messi I've managed to play against Ronaldo when he was in his prime and look Ronaldo was a serious serious player but for the way Messi can manipulate the ball when he's got old and what we're talking about the way he went past Guardiola when he was playing Croatia and then stopped him again at the at, at the 18 yard line and then does him again and goes to the end line he's managed to reinvent himself and I don't think you'd see Ronaldo now running past people stopping them and running past them again he's had to change his game to a certain extent but I think Messi is the one who's constantly involved in his game the pace people have caught up with him he manipulate the ball that little bit better he'll move the ball one or two touch and he really is just a joy to watch. And sadly, I know we all look at him and think, what a great player. He's excellent. I Sadly, I don't think we we'll realise how good he is until he's actually gone and we're looking for the next Messi. I know we're already putting that that type of title into Mbappe, but totally, totally different players. The way Messi can just make a show of people. Mbappe can run past you, but Messi can make you look very, very silly at times. Yeah, and as I said, in terms of uh, we've we've been privileged to watch Messi in this in this generation. He's definitely going to go down as the greatest of the this last twenty years or so. And there have been some other great players, as we mentioned, Ronaldo. You go back to Zidane and and the likes as well. But um, we're probably not old enough to really remember Maradona and his pomp. Certainly not old enough to uh, remember Pele. I think that's a, that's for the grandparents' generation or so. But uh, where would you put him in terms of what what you may know or what you have seen of the likes of Maradona? And Pele, and now that Messi has this World Cup on top of it, and he played such a huge role in getting Argentina over the line, is he is is he the greatest of all time for you? I think he has to be. I think uh, look, I, I said before, I think he was already the greatest of all time coming into this World Cup. But and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but to bring that Argentina team and win the World Cup with them, that's an outstanding, outstanding achievement. I know the sprinklings of superstars in there, but as a team. 
without Messi, they just unravel into being an, a, a fairly average enough team. When you look at Romero and not the Mendy, they, they, they've been excellent. But Rodrigo, De Paul, McAllister stepping up as well. Alvarez looks like a superstar in his own right now as well. But Messi's the one. You know, if you take Messi out of that team at all, just starts to unfold. It's it's the the star Dustin. Look at when you've got Messi in your team, you're never going to be completely out of a game. And that's what I, I loved about Argentina. The defending at that time has, has left question marks over them, but it's Messi just filling gaps. You know, there, there is weaknesses in that Argentina team, but with Messi there, he just seems to be able to, to cover all the cracks and, and, and get the wins for them, which is Look, for me, he's, like, even France on paper are a much better team for me than Argentina, but it's the messy fact that that has won the World Cup for Argentina. So for me, if there was any doubt in some people's minds, it should be completely gone now. We should be the best of all time. And like you say, Raph, we're probably not old enough to... We've seen bits and bobs of Maradona, but I think Messi is more important to this Argentina team than Diego Maradona was back then. Yeah, something Ronnie Whelan said, it would be a bigger achievement... Uh, if Messi were to leave this Argentina in comparison to Maradona in 86 because Maradona had some great players around like Valdano and the likes but uh, obviously as you said Argentina are sort of imperfect champions uh, France is uh, next up for Ireland in terms of competitive games in Euro 2024 they'll have time to recover from this it looks like Deschamps is going to stay on um, Keith obviously the French are going to be favourites when we play them uh, based on current form, the fact that their World Cup finalists almost made history in doing it back to back. Um, what have you made of them in terms of, or has it changed your perception in terms of your expectations when we do face them in March? Um, no, not not so ever. No, I don't think they were that bad, Raph, that I expect us to go and get a result on them in, <laughs> in, in uh, March. Look at it. I, I, I'm going to credit Argentina with an awful lot of stuff. I know there's question marks over the virus. And that's probably why a couple of the French lads haven't turned up on the day. But on paper, that, that French team is, is better than the Argentinian team. I think the French team that comes to Dublin in March will be a lot more on it. And Mbappe, you know, he's so, so dangerous. How are we going to keep, keep him under wraps? Even if by some miracle we do manage to keep him under wraps, Griezmann looks to have come to the party. He was awful in the Nations League. I know he wasn't great today, but he's had a really good tournament for me. Dembele, awful today, but had a really good tournament. And when these lads turn up in in, uh, in the Aviva in March, you realise just how good they are. Because when you see Griezmann live and he's walk rate at that number 10 row, it's going to be really, really hard. So if we start trying to play out from the back, I think we could get a pocket pick once or twice and get hurt. I, I'm not saying I want to play long ball stuff, but Traditionally, when, when we do play these so-called bigger nations at home, I think we're all right. I think we go, we go, we, we throw a few punches. and Look, I think we'll have a fight and loss against the French, but like I say, it, it's the lower nations that, that I really have question marks that I want. The teams that we should be putting away, I want us to put away. You know, it's the likes of the France and that's some of the best players in the world. I'm not too concerned about because it's all relative, really. So look yeah. at March, I think a, a fight and loss is probably all we can hope for there. Yeah, and now it's time to talk about players of the tournaments, coaches of the tournament, and then we'll we'll get uh, Keith's team of the tournament as well. But Peter, I guess, in terms of player of the tournament, had the result gone the other way towards the French, I guess uh, some of those names that have been mentioned, like Griezmann or Mbappe, probably would have uh, would have gone. Obviously, FIFA went with Messi, and uh, I don't think a lot of people are going to be arguing against that, even if they argue about other things that FIFA may say or do. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that was it. I mean... Happy, you know, he's got his, what is it, 12 goals in 14 World Cup games, uh, got his hat-trick today, was, you know, was good for France all the way through, didn't, as Keith said, probably didn't have the best game, or did, like, get three goals, but still doesn't have, like, an amazing game today, um, but yeah, I mean, there was just so many occasions, I mean, it, we were saying it all, uh, before we came on, Raph, like, the incredible thing is Argentina lost their opening game in this tournament, and the doubts that people had about the Argentinian team were then all coming to light, it, it almost... Like if they wanted to build themselves a bit of motivation, they certainly found it after that first game because everyone who said Ash ah, sure, like Argentina were never going to win it, etc. After that first game, all of the articles, all of the quotes, pieces online, the little short videos, and etc. So for the team to turn around and for Messi to be such a big part of it, yeah, like it, it is, it's it's sort of fairy tale stuff, and I'm sure it's part of the deal with the movie that they're making as well that he had to be named for the tournament. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder who's going to play Scaloni. Who's obviously has to has to have uh, has to have credit in terms of how he's how he responded and got them rolling again. Obviously, with with a gem like Messi and the team, but also to shift formation loads of times. In terms of your like the managers that have impressed you during the tournament, Keith, uh, who have they been? I presume Scaloni's in there as well. Yeah, look, Scaloni after winning it, and like you say, he's quite reactive with his tactics. He sees what other people are doing and sets up from there, which I like. You know, he. 
he has different uh, different different plans A, B, and C. I really I, I don't think you can look too far past Didier Deschamps. You know, it, what's a sixty odd year since Brazil managed to defend the World Cup? France coming very very close and. Look, they've beaten teams, France. I, I think they were very, very lucky to get past the English in the quarterfinals. This is just a, a step too far for them. But, you know, to go to back-to-back World Cup finals, I think Didier Deschamps, although there'll be quite a, a sour feeling in his mouth right now, I think in hindsight, he's been excellent over the last eight years for the French. So, yeah, I, I think Didier Deschamps should be right up there today aside. Yeah, also Regra Gui of uh, Morocco as well, and probably Zlatko Dalic of Croatia would be probably others that uh, would get a lot of credit. Probably Louis van Gaal as well, in a way, uh, with a fairly average Dutch team getting to the quarterfinals. But in terms of the team of the tournament, so we'll get your picks here in a second, Keith. But in terms of the goalkeepers, Peter, the two that featured in the final probably will be in and amongst it. But uh, there's been a, a, another couple, two or three, that have also impressed. Yeah, Liva Kovic for Croatia was good uh, as well. Um, I, yeah, like I suppose there was a couple of games where France didn't concede goals, and obviously the first two group games, and then in the semi as well. So, Larice, it kind of seems unfair, to, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I necessarily have him. Like I would, ha- I'd obviously have to have him in that conversation, but at the same time, he wouldn't be my pick. So, um, yeah, I, I quite like Croatia. Either. Like I liked uh, Liva Kovic. I thought he was good. Uh, if I was picking a team, I think I might throw him in there. I thought he made some good stops, and he just again. He inspired a bit of confidence in his in his def- in his back four and five throughout the games he was involved in. Yeah, and Keith, who's your pick in the end? I ended up with Lekovic, but I, I would give an honourable mention to Bono. I'm not sure if I'm saying that really. Uh, the the goalkeeper from Morocco. I know he nearly scored an OG yesterday. He nearly kicked the ball into his own net. But in terms of the whole tournament, he's been really really good. And you know, you, you try to go away from the obvious ones like your Martinez or uh, your Hugo Lloris as the two finalists. Yeah, Lekovac and Bono for me have, were absolutely excellent given the, the so-called lesser nation tag. So, yeah, I, I put either of them two and I'd be happy with. Yeah, and uh, when we move to the full backs, Peter, I guess uh, the Moroccans will feature, especially Hakimi will probably feature quite a lot, but there were a few few impressive performers in there. Yeah, well, Hakimi was certainly on, on the, the little list that I drew up here before he came on. Aranovic uh, was obviously decent as well. Um, yeah, I mean, Morocco's run... Definitely involved a couple of their right and left back. So I mean that they were they were definitely would have been involved and uh, been involved in any kind of team you pick. Hernandez didn't have a obviously good game today, but then he had to step up to come in to the tournament, you know, obviously after what happened uh, in that first game. So I think he probably deserves special mention. But um yeah, that, that would be kind of the, the players I was looking at, Hakimi and Hernandez. So I'd like to look at them throughout the tournament. And Keith, in terms of your picks then for full back, right back and left back, who uh, who makes the cut? I went for Juranovic, uh, um, a Croatia from your right back. I know uh, there's been one or two decent. Hakimi was excellent as well, but I've I, I, been really, really impressed with Juranovic. I'd be surprised if he stays at Celtic. He might get the, the next six months out of him, but I do think he'll move on. It's no disrespect to Celtic. I just think he, he's proven that he can play at the next level. And I, I know he didn't start the final today, but I really like Acuna, the left back, the Argentinian left back to come on. Talia Fico is not a bad player either, but... For me, Acuna just has that little bit of physicality about him as well. He get up and down the pitch, lots of desire. I have to be honest, now, left back was a, a, a position I really struggled with. I've got and Guardiola and uh, Sois as me two centre halves, but the left back, I really struggled to pick out a, a left back who really impressed me. And like I say, I settled on Acuna, the, the Argentinian uh, left back. Yeah, I had the same because I had a short list down. I didn't actually pick one in the end, but I had Masrawi, who actually normally plays on the right for Bayern Munich and previously for Ajax. Daly Blind was in there, obviously part of the Dutch team, the quarterfinals. Hernandez too, and then there was uh, Sosa as well. But there, it was probably a bit more to the right. You know, the the right side was a bit more impressive. You, you see the likes of Dumfries in there. You have uh, Kunde, who actually did reasonably well throughout the tournament as a kind of centre back out of position. Even Kyle Walker, sort of, is another example. Um, but yeah, as you said, your centre backs are Vardiol and uh, Saïs. I mean, Vardiol, best defender in the tournament for you, albeit despite the uh, what happened with Messi in the last game. I, I was just going to say that, you know, he was getting the tag as the best new, the best uh, centre-half in the tournament, doing so well. And then all of a sudden, Messi just twists him up and makes him look very, very average. I think we can let him away with that. He's only 20 years old. It was literally not even a big mistake. He thinks Messi's going to come in and shoot on his left foot. He blocks the left channel, little manipulation of the ball, swing of the hips. The next thing you know, he's at the boy line and he's pulled it back for Alvarez to finish. 
other than that, I can't think of anything Vardy all done wrong in the whole of the tournament. I think he's been excellent. And the, the centre half next on Romain Sois from Morocco. What can you say about him? He, he was excellent, absolutely brilliant. I, I loved watching the Moroccans play. You know, tactically, probably not the nicest thing to look at in the eye, but determination, being a team and having having a walk rate and a never never say die attitude, it can get you quite far in games. And I think Morocco proved that and Croatia as well to a certain degree. Yeah, when we look at the midfield, Peter, I guess, uh, obviously Luka Modric, in, it was in the uh, the team picked by the panel and uh, I think the quote was that he had to be in there. And there's a lot of there's a lot of options there. We're talking about a trio, whether it's defensive or attacking. Uh, yeah, that was an interesting quote. We, we did discuss it off the whole idea that Modric had to be in there. He was good. Like, obviously, um, Croatia did a lot better than people expected them to do, even though they'd been, obviously, in the final the last time. But whether he definitely had to be in there, I don't know. He, um you know, there's, yeah, as you say, depending on which way you're, you're looking at your formation or which way you're setting up your team, like McAllister will probably get a shout in there. Uh, Jude Begum was good, obviously. Um, Amrabat for Morocco, which I know I've kind of mentioned Morocco players, but they did, it was just a kind of a breath of fresh air team that I had, I admit, I'd openly admit had absolutely no idea really about before the tournament kicked off. So you were trying to learn as as you went looking at those players. So yeah, those three lads would definitely be in a bit to pick uh, players in that area of the pitch. But yeah, Madrid was good, but as I said, I think it's possibly overstated that he has to be in there. It's it's that thing that at the end of the season or at the end of competition or whatever it might be, it's it's a, a vote based on maybe things he's done in the past more so than, that's not to say that he wasn't good in this tournament, he was, but whether he was in your pick of three or four players in midfield, I wouldn't be so convinced. Yeah, and Keith, in terms of the formation you picked for this team, what was it? And also did Modric make it into your midfield? Yeah, Modric made it into my field. I've, I've gone for a 4-3-3, so I've gone with Amrabat Holden as a holding midfielder, just protecting the back four. I've then gone for McAllister and Modric. And to be honest with you, I've been impressed with McAllister, but today in the final, when the chips were down, he was absolutely excellent. He has that little bit of talent and the walk rate as well is, is a big, big thing for me. And Modric, with the way the Croatian midfield just seemed to control every game from the middle, I know they're a little bit toothless up front, but you know, Modric has never been really renowned as a, as a great goal scorer, but you can give this ball, you can give this boy the ball, you can fire at his Adam's apple when he's got players around him and he just control it and play it off. And he's so, so clever with his movement. And yeah, Modric, probably his, his last game for Croatia, he, he deserves it. And when it was coming to the nitty gritty, when people were saying, oh, I'd love Messi to win it, I'd love Messi to win it. Oh, he was also saying, but what about Modric, you know, a, a brilliant professional, never puts a foot wrong in terms of the media or his personal life. So, I wouldn't have been upset had Modric have uh, lifted the World Cup trophy. Yeah, so my my midfield is McAllister, Modric, and Amrabat. Two, uh, two, two. I wouldn't say flair players. McAllister a bit of flair, Modric a bit of flair, and Amrabat has the a little bit of physicality in there as well. Yeah, and uh, in terms of your front three, I can I can probably guess two of them, but uh, who? Uh, <laughs> I suppose you can probably just reveal exactly who, who those obvious two are, and also who the third uh, player that goes in alongside them is. Yeah, well, I've got Messi through the middle, obviously, where he's seven goals. It, it speaks for himself. So I don't think I need to need to defend that one. And Bappe coming off the left with his eight goals. Again, don't really need to defend that one. And, and Julian Alvarez coming off the right, you know, not exactly as a winger per se, but just trying to be that link towards Messi and, and Mbappe. For me, you know, you're looking at there's so much talent around this World Cup, but Julian Alvarez has just forced his way in there for the four goals. And, you know, you're looking at the Argentina team, you think Messi can't do it all by himself. I know he did a large, large degree by himself, but them four goals, if you take them out of the Argentina team, they really do struggle to, to progress through the round. So Alvarez, a huge, huge part of what Argentina did, as was Messi and Mbappe, you know, just, just so, so dangerous with that pace. So Alvarez, Messi and Mbappe, the front three for me, which I'm sure a large majority of people would have went for. Yeah, for sure. And obviously, uh, an, uh, 11 players there who contributed what was a really good uh, tournament on the pitch. Obviously, Peter, off the pitch as well, um, you know, the, the legacy of the tournament uh, won't look quite as bright as what we saw on, you know, within, within the confines of the pitch. I mean, there were, uh, from, the, from the moment Qatar was given the World Cup uh, back in 2010, you know, the, the human rights issues have been discussed, treatment of migrant workers, LGBT rights, uh, among many other issues as well. And the thing with this tournament, obviously, Peter, it seemed it, it, that those issues did keep propping up and it often came from sort of FIFA trying to clamp down on discussions about it. Yeah, and um, like 
look, probably the guts, not, not maybe no more than a million. I'm not exactly sure the figures just yet, but they'd be close to a million people who watched it in RT across TV and the player. Um, there are billions watching around the world. So there, there was a, a narrative maybe before the tournament that because of the things that had happened off the park, because of the uh, issues related to LGBTQI rights, women's rights, the death of migrant workers, that people weren't going to watch the competition. But ultimately, like this is how these things work. You know, people ultimately will watch such a global event like the World Cup. So that that kind of that whole element of people not watching the tournament was gone fairly quickly. And uh, obviously, what happened on the pitch was fantastic. What happened off it, yeah. I mean, this the quote that stood out for me was from Nasser al It was about 10 or 11 days ago, and he was the CEO of the World Cup, and he said, death is a natural part of life. And I kind of thought, like, that is a particularly unimpressive quote to put out in defense of the fact that, you know, I know, like, the Qatari figures are, I think, 40 who have died related to workers at the World Cup. The Guardian had the report that said six and a half thousand, so I don't know where it is in between that the figures are, but whether it's three, whether it's 40, or whether it's six and a half thousand, Death is a, is a natural part of life is a, is a pretty terrible way to try to dismiss the whole thing and say, well, the tournament is a success, so it doesn't matter. So that's the whole question. Darren Maloney said on one of the other podcasts, I'm not sure if it was one of yours or after one of Mikey's, in six months' time, that's when the real questions will have to be asked because it's easy for everyone to pack up now. Everyone goes home. They enjoy watching the tournament. It was a brilliant end to the final from the 80th minute onwards and all the excitement we had. But what happens in six months? Um, and also, how much say should sport and football have in all of that? Like there's unquestionably questions around FIFA if these tournaments, okay, the people involved who awarded this tournament are not necessarily there anymore, although some of them still are. Um, so the question then becomes, what is the impact on football? If there's still money to be made for people at the top, will tournaments like this still continue to happen? Should they only be held in Europe or North America as well? There's, there's so many various things to be talked about, so it's impossible to... Kind of break it down into a couple of sentences but i do think that was the line that really stood out for me whatever about infantino calling it the best world cup ever like he's going to say that but when they're actually saying people involved in the Qatari administration that sure like death is a natural part of life that was the one that stood out that made me think like it's just it's a mad position to be in watching a world cup considering you know as we said earlier on like france 98 or uh, korean japan 2002 those early world cups that i remember it's just a completely different kind of environment for a world cup to happen in i suppose yeah, because just on that point, um, I think I've mentioned it on the podcast a few times in this interview, you can see it on um, YouTube. So it was pr prior to the tournament, sort of late, oct uh, late October, um, speaking to Amnesty International's head of economic and social justice, Stephen Cockburn. And it, at the time, direct quote, he was saying in regards to the whole compensation package thing, Peter, that um, they were, you know, time is running out in terms of compensating migrant workers affected by uh, the issues it related to the building of stadiums and infrastructure in Qatar. And, you know, now we time has moved on and we're right at the, you know, at the very end of the tournament. You know, the conversations are going to move on about the next Euros and then the 2026 World Cup, which we'll touch on very briefly before we go. But, um, yeah, there's as you said, there's going to be this sense of will you know will the spotlight remain as strong on Qatar uh, over the next few years now once the the football family as it is called sort of move on. Yeah, and that's the key takeaway from all of this. Um, it's easy to do it now, and I mean there was even various quotes from some of the journalists. Some journalists were saying, "Well, things aren't so bad in Qatar. We've had a good experience, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. There was a good quote from uh, from Gavin the forty two. He sort of said like we have no idea what's happening at the World Cup because we're only being brought through the media section on particular public transport, etc. So we're not really getting to see what things are like over here. So that will be the real question, and that's maybe when you know it becomes more of a news item where news journalists will have to kind of follow up on it, and it'll be really interesting to see who does what happens in six months' time or a year's time in terms of. Um, what's being reported on, what's being mentioned, or even in the build-up to the next World Cup, because I'm sure you're going to touch it, it'll be a different, I I can't imagine we're going to have, you know, six and a half thousand workers dying in building stadiums in North America or in Mexico or whatever, so it's going to be a completely different kind of build-up, there'll still be criticisms, but not in the same way, so it'll be interesting to see in the build-up to the next World Cup, is there any comparisons or returns to Qatar or that kind of thing and, and how that comes about, but yeah, at this moment in time, as I said, people watched it was massive viewership, you know, they had record um, revenues. I think it was something like just over 7 billion euro that they took in FIFA. So from their end, it's ticked all those kinds of boxes. And as you said, they've managed to get through it now. We're at the other side. So it's, it's going to be really interesting to see what comes about.
Yeah, and Keith, uh, that next World Cup, of course, happening in the United States, Mexico and Canada in the summer of 2026. But what's going to be different, of course, is it's going to be a 48-team tournament. So this 32-team format, which seems to work well, uh, at least mathematically, and also in terms of the eye test, in terms of the matches that we see, that's going to be uh, a bygone thing. Are, are you in favour of the of this expansion which looks like it is gonna it is um set in stone and if uh, and even if you're not what format in terms of group stages and things you think would actually work in terms of maintaining a good level in the tournament it's, it's, it's a tough one to answer raf because you know there's, there's certain uh, nations that have come into this tournament the likes of your japan morocco a couple of others that you're thinking they're just cannon fodder you know they're just going to get lashed over by everybody but the japanese were really good croatia were obviously very good Morocco went and got to the semi-final. So we all love an underdog story, you know. So we, we want these, these so-called lesser nations to be able to make their way in and, and make things happen. And look again, from an Irish point of view, I think we could, we could branch it out to 100 nations and maybe then we get into it. But look, I think the bigger, the better. You know, the, the more nations in it, the better. But I, I do see it from a footballer's point of view, the, the, a top footballer's point of view. There's going to be so many games that there's more countries, there's more qualifying games, and so on and so forth. And with Giovanni Infantino saying he wants a club World Cup as well in the next couple of years, I just don't see where the lads get a break. And, you know, if you want to keep the, the standard of football as high as it is, you need to give the top lads rest. And at the minute, they're just not getting that. I'm all for a club World Cup, but like I say, I'm just not sure with me, with me footballers hat on where it comes in and where the lads get the rest. Yeah, and also the Club World Cup, Keith, I guess, it's a bit of a strange one because uh, the strongest teams are pretty much all playing in the Champions League in Europe. I mean, uh, there's obviously some good sides in South America that play in the Copa Libertadores, but I don't see how um, that doesn't just evolve and eventually, once you get to the latter stages of a Club World Cup, that it just ends up being like a European Champions League. Yeah, but again, I don't think Infantino's too worried about who gets to the final in terms of the, the Club World Cup. I think he's more bothered about how many many millions or billions he can bring in uh, hosting the tournament somewhere. So again, Infantino's just worried about bringing more money in. We said he brought over €7 billion Euro in during the World Cup. A massive, massive success. And let's not forget, there was huge, huge out outrage. There still is about the, the tournament being held in Qatar. But the footballers, with the standard of football and Saudi Arabia beating Argentina so early on in the tournament, I think that dug FIFA out of a huge hole. People were thinking, we can't miss any games. We have to watch them all. And it just had everybody glued to their screens. And I think FIFA owe a huge, huge debt to the players because I think they dug them out of a hole with the, with the standard of football. It glued everybody to the screen because, like I say, the outrage was, was, was really real and still is real. But the standard of football, you just couldn't take your eyes off and the players I know got a lot of aggro for going to going to guitar. It's not really there. It's not their forte. The footballers they don't make the decisions. But for me, I think they've dug FIFA out of a huge hole with the standard they provided. Yeah, as you said, Argentina lost their opening game to Saudi Arabia, which sort of blew the tournament wide open. And just like Spain, they go on from losing the opening game to becoming champions for 2022. Who knows who the champions will be in 2026? Obviously, Felicitaciones, uh, uh, Lionel Messi uh, e uh, uh, Argentina también. But uh, we'll be back. Uh, we'll, we'll have an RT Soccer podcast, obviously, next, uh, next year. Once the League of Ireland season kicks off, you can watch the rugby podcast as well and also the GA podcast once the... Uh, uh, the hurling, uh, camogie and uh, ladies football and Gaelic football seasons kick off. Uh, they'll be all back in uh, 2023. That's a long way away. And with the tension, obviously, Peter, of uh, the game, I, I was actually kind of worried I wouldn't make it to 2023 either. Such was my uh, <laughs> my heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, like, if Ireland had got to the World Cup final, would there have been as much people jumping around and screaming in the office as there was towards the end of that match? Because there's that element of... Um, like, obviously, we all want Ireland to qualify for the World Cup, but when they're not involved, you can sit back and enjoy it all the, that bit more, almost, because it doesn't matter who wins the game. You're just watching it from a purely supporting perspective. Um, and, yeah, like, it's it's going to be... It's a weird situation. Like, I don't know what the, the next RT soccer podcast will be looking at. What format of tournament will we have? How do you break it down? Like, how much of an influence will club managers have on what format happens at the next World Cup? You know, will they prefer... 16 groups of three because it's just a couple of matches or you know if it goes to what is it 12 groups of four, four you know, yeah. it's more matches and oh, it's, it's going to be a headache and yeah we can't qualify for our 2014 European Championships I don't know if we're going to be one of the 16 that goes to the World Cup but um, 
yeah, it's look, it's it, from a purely sporting perspective, it's, it's been a great finish to the tournament today. And uh, when it was 2 0, you know, if you'd said to me after 79 minutes, this was going to be remembered as one of the potentially great finals, I would have been laughing at you. So we got our entertainment's worth in the last whatever it was hour thereafter. So, um, yeah, Messi's won a great finish. Uh, no complaints in that regard in terms of what happened on the field. Yeah, and next Sunday, of course, and it's hard to believe when you're talking about World Cups, it's Christmas dinner for everybody. So I have to wish you all, Peter Brown, again, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. And uh, Keith Tracy, the same to you as well. Merry Christmas, Raf. Good stuff. That's it for this uh, World Cup podcast. We'll be back uh, very soon with uh, our range of other podcasts, of course. But anyway, thanks for listening in during the tournament.